So I'm a neurologist uh, and mainly a sleep researcher and uh, also an epidemiologist. And uh, first I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here. I have enjoyed the meeting. The ambience is very good and, and the experts are the best of the world. And uh, I can see that there are also a lot of experts here in the audience. And I consider both physicians ex ex as experts, but also patients are experts. <coughs> so I will... Mm, yeah. I will talk a little bit about uh, this problem of functional disorders and dysautonomia, a few words about history, then about a term called autophilia, which I think maybe uh, is probably a very important one to understand. Uh, just to mention the double waggle theory of Porges. Um, how many of you have uh, heard about Porges? A few, but not not many, because I think that the, the Porges theory are, are, is very important. And then um, uh, showing uh, some of the, our findings in POTS and about the difference in ortho and parasympathetic tone in POTS, so whether it's a problem of uh, sympathicotonia or whether it's a problem of uh, hypo parasympathetic, uh, parasympathetic tone. So <coughs> first, when we think about, uh, when we talk about these functional disorders, um, uh, I'll just go quickly. We in Western physiology, philosophy, we uh, have the Descartes dualistic, uh, Cartesian dualistic idea of, of uh, body and mind. And, and this is something that I can often see that some doctors say, well, it's just functional, it's just psychiatry, it, has it is not a real disease. It's just something, you know, over the cortex, somewhere in the mind. Here, the cut is just saying that somebody is doing something. Um, and this is something that, in fact, I think that in Eastern philosophy, uh, which can be called substance dualism, uh, there is a metaphysical line between consciousness and matter, where matter includes both body and mind. And this is something which is uh, like a holistic uh, medicine, and I think that we should think in, uh, in this way more of the Eastern philosophy way. This uh, figure, probably many of you have seen, actually comes from uh, Mayo Clinic. So, uh, Phil Fisher, are you here? You are there? No, he, he's not here, but he knows. So, this is from the Mayo Clinic uh, 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 algorithm of classification of the Dutch autonomia. And as you can see, these are functional ones. And here is POTS, and there are also many other things, including migraine. And then we have the uh, structural. Um, uh, um, problems. So in this one, the POTS is under the umbrella of uh, dysautonomia. And now when we go to um, dysautonomia and we think about uh, autonomic nervous system, I just show this figure because I think this is uh, very nice, showing different emotions. Uh, oh, again, what I did. So uh, uh, emos different emotions uh, related to autonomic nervous system, uh, uh, and, and we can see that where, what is happening in the body. And if we have anger, this is where the circulation increases and the temperature increases in fear, dis disgust, happiness, sadness, surprise, and if we are neutral, we are like this. So this is part of the things that whatever we feel, if we are anxious or we are happy or so, and mainly if we are anxious, we feel it uh, here in the, t here. And of course, because the celiac uh, plexus is here and, and, and this is the center of the autonomic nervous system. So we, we feel it here. And, and this is why we really cannot make a difference between uh, mental function and anxiety and, and uh, autonomic nervous system. In fact, I believe more and more that uh, anxiety uh, is a problem of uh, proper functioning of the autonomic nervous system. So <coughs> then I go to this term called autophilia, because uh, I found that in history. Uh, and actually, um, um, the paper comes from t 1934. It was published in British Medical Journal by Patchett Lapas uh, from Royal Manchester Children's Hospital. And, and the idea is that we have, uh, and, and uh, I have modified it a little bit. So uh, we have genes, uh, we have gut microbiome, and then people maybe uh, uh, are different types. We, ha we have people with autophilia, and then we have people who do not have uh, autophilia. 
Then along the lines, we have nutrition, infections, and so on, many, many things, behavioral factors, stress, and so on, which may do something uh, f for the autophiliac people. If we have a joint hypermobility, uh, EDS, uh, it, it may also do something, and there may be genetic links. So which kind of people are autophiliac people? Uh, <coughs> autophiliac people, they, uh, when they were children, they, they were often pale, not necessarily anemic, but they were sensitive, reacting easily, flush easily, f they were fainting when seeing blood, they had tr travel sick sickness, they often had uh, nose bleeding, uh, and they had uh, intense reactions, uh, emotional reactions. And they were uh, often lean as a child, so they had to eat a lot, and even if they uh, ate a lot, they did not become obese. <coughs> and then uh, as adults, uh, uh, they are mentally, uh, autophils are emotional, they are sensitive, excitable, and they are keenly interested. So if I look at this audience, I would say that many of here are keenly interested because <laughs> you have come to this uh, symposium. And then what comes in later in the time? They may develop autopathia, which means that they develop allergies, atopia, exanthemes, asthma, and chronic inflammations. They may have a spasmophilia, which are spasms, abdominal pains, irrit irritable bubble syndrome, and coronary spasms as well. Or they may uh, produce neuropathia, uh, uh, La Paz called them neuropathia, of course it's different from what we understand it today. Uh, so autonomic disturbances, migraine and chronic pain. And they also, these autophiliac people uh, developed often psychopathia w with anxiety mainly and uh, psychiatric disorders or dissociative disorders. So my feeling uh, may well be that is it so that most patients or if not all patients with POTS uh, are autophiliac from the birth. So then, <laughs> this uh, is something that uh, if those who don't know Porges, I uh, highly recommend to read uh, some of the papers of, uh, uh, of uh, Stephen Porges and about his uh, polyvagal theory that goes in phylogenetics from, uh, from re uh, fish and reptiles to, uh, to mammals. And it's very interesting because uh, the, the vagal system is the uh, oldest system in, the, uh, in any animals. And then there is the, uh, like the, like the noradrenergic system, which is developing above that. And then humans and, and, and um, uh, let's say, um, mammals, they have like an another vagal system there, which is controlled by the frontal lobe and the basal frontal lobe mainly. And it's like the break. It's like the break of the sympathetic system. So now we can understand, and I will come back to that, that uh, and we have now also some scientific evidence that POTS may be a problem of the lack of the other vehicle break. So there is no break, and that is why we have tachycardia and, 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 uh, and other systems. So it's just to mention Porges, uh, it's interesting. So now uh, about the diagnosis of POTS, I will just skip that. Uh, we have heard excellent um, uh, talk, talks and, and we, um, we are doing the same things. Uh, just to mention something that in my opinion, if we are doing the test sometimes, we do it uh, at least 20 minutes and sometimes we go up to 30 minutes just to see in the mild cases what is there and what is there not. So, <coughs> and now we have tried, uh, we have used different systems uh, in the tilt test and, and in uh, uh, and in active standing test, uh, we have uh, now switched to this kind of systems where we have electrocardiogram and then we have a platysmogram uh, and we uh, uh, calculate so-called pulse transit time. Uh, first, we calibrate the blood pressure uh, uh, carefully uh, w uh, before uh, starting it. And th when we have calibrated it, we can see nicely the, uh, the uh, the heart rate, and this is this comes from electrocardiogram, so that is accurate. And then we can see the systolic and diastolic uh, uh, pulse. We can also see the uh, SpO2. So uh, here the scale is uh, quite small, but this is a POTS, so that increase of uh, uh, heart rate, but no change in systolic or diastolic um, uh, blood pressure. Is it a problem of, uh, of um, sympathetic or parasympathetic system? Um, uh, we have been looking that, and we are currently looking that in in uh, recently. Uh, we can do it with this system nicely uh, b because we can uh, look for different bands uh, uh, in the heart rate. So uh, before going to that, uh, in clinical practice, uh, the symptoms are variable, as we heard from many authors today. So there is not uh, just one clinical picture. 
uh, uh, the problem is here that the subjective symptoms and the observed disorders and neurological examination findings do not always fit. And that is why many patients are diagnosed as a conversion uh, disorder or a dissociative uh, problem. Uh, then we can of course ask that what is a conversion? Uh, and uh, my feeling is that conversion is also something in the brain because we cannot have any signs or symptoms without the uh, involvement of the brain. But uh, that is really a difficult issue. So here are uh, just a uh, uh, sample of 11 patients. These are 11 patients that also Gerd Wallukat has been looking for uh, with the antibodies. And these are patients uh, all with POTS. And these are patients that we have, uh, the, uh, uh, we have looked also for the antibodies. I will not um, uh, look at them, but you these are included in the series of Wallukat that you saw. And actually many of them had antibodies uh, either against beta-2 or muscarin uh, 2 receptors. And again, uh, same kind of symptoms as, uh, as we have already heard. But I would just show um, some examples. This is kind of a rash uh, skin reactions that uh, one is, uh, and you can see that uh, there is a rash just above the line of the, of the shoes. Uh, he was examined uh, by a professor of dermatology in uh, two university hospitals, and really it was very difficult to say what is the reason. And finally, uh, uh, we think that it, it is something in the autonomic, uh, something autono in the autonomic nervous uh, system. And by the way, he, uh, he is a narcolepsy patient with POTS, and also POTS is quite common also in uh, narcolepsy. Uh, and then again, other types of skin reaction. Also, he was examined carefully in, by dermatologists. It looks like uh, contact dermatitis, but it is not. And uh, so uh, we really did not under, uh, understand uh, very well what it is. And then uh, this is one patient where you see uh, uh, red, red nails. And then I will, uh, and then uh, peripheral neuro uh, uh, involvement of the autonomic nervous system, and and also that uh, even if you put uh, fingers in the hot water for 30 minutes, nothing happens. So normally when we put our hands in the hot water, we we see wringling, but uh, patients with POTS often do not have any wringling. So it's so-called wringle test, which is a sheep sheep test and simple test of looking for for um, peripheral autonomic nervous um, uh, disturbance. And then they may also have some uh, odd uh, uh, phenomenon. This is a kind of a myoclonic that you can see. So it's, it looks like a, a, a clonus, but uh, so there is uh, abnormal movements, but there is no Babinski sign, uh, so, uh, but it certainly it is abno uh, abnormal. And then if we look here, And, and, and here you can see so-called uh, belly dancer syndrome. So even if she was talking and uh, do we were doing other things, the abdomen was going all the time like that. And that is called uh, like the belly dancer symptom or focal, focal uh, abdominal uh, myoclonus. So what about the uh, orthosympathetic uh, uh, and parasympathetic tone in POTS? So we have currently started to look at that. And I'll show you this picture. And I think this is very interesting. And this is also something also for Julia that we could do in collaboration or start to do, because um, actually nobody has been doing it before. <coughs> um, this is unpublished, so I really hope that we do it together. Um, but uh, the idea is that when we are doing orthostatic tests, we plot at the same time uh, indicators for uh, for um, sympathetic tone, for example, with the LF band, and then uh, uh, high frequency band, which uh, correlates more to uh, parasympathetic tone. And um, this is just one example. There is clear POTS, so no change in systolic blood pressure, no change in uh, mean arterial pressure, clear POTS. And now if we look for the uh, sympathetic tone, not so much changes, but parasympathetic tone goes down. And that seems to be the case in most cases with uh, uh, POTS with fatigue. I don't know in different uh, uh, phenotypes. And I would be very, very interested to look at that in different phenotypes. It may well be that we can discriminate different types of POTS by uh, looking at, is it mainly in the, uh, no, again, I did. Is it mainly in the uh, uh, problem of high sympathetic tone or is it 
low parasympathetic tone because they come out to the same result. And some patients may have a uh, high sympathetic tone and low parasympathetic, and then, of course, the difference is even greater. So this is, uh, uh, I think, interesting, and, and I, I look forward to collaboration by looking at the bands. Uh, then, uh, mm, looking for sleep, uh, Julia showed something, uh, and uh, they are looking uh, for sleep in Newcastle. Uh, um, there is uh, only one, I would say, a good paper looking for polysonography by uh, Bagai uh, et al. from uh, Canada. Um, so we have uh, uh, looked at that uh, now in Finland, and we have a paper submitted. It is uh, under review, and the reviewers were quite positive. So uh, I'm quite positive that it will be accepted, uh, and um, it may come out even this year or in the beginning of next year. So uh, the, uh, what we looked is that it seems that deep sleep uh, uh, may not be restorative in patients with chronic fatigue and POTS. And uh, just to remind you that there are two main functions probably of deep sleep. The other one is formation of new energy, so-called astrocyte neuron lactate shuttle, which has been published by the Magistretti and Pellerini and others. And the other main uh, function of sleep probably is the lymphatic, lymphatic flow, we're getting rid of waste products when we sleep, uh, and this has been published for the first time in 2013 by Mike and Nedergaard. Um, uh, he was in uh, US, now he is back in uh, Copenhagen. So, and uh, now if patients with uh, POTS and chronic fatigue do not have this kind of uh, restorative sleep, they don't have new energy, and something is accumulating in the brain, which causes dysfunction of the uh, brain, and also uh, it may cause also dysautonomia. And just to go uh, quickly, uh, so these are CFS patients, but they all have POTS, so we used very, very well-defined criteria. This is, is only CFS with POTS, so it's not all uh, CFS. And now if we look here, heart rate, uh, heart rate in... Uh, Excuse me. Heart rate uh, um, goes down uh, uh, in deep sleep as it should, uh, but then if we look for the uh, uh, sympathetic tone, uh, it seems that uh, that in the sympathetic uh, sympathetic uh, tone uh, it increases in CFS, and that is according to normal physiology because in normal patients it goes down, as you can see here. And now if we look for the LF in LF, no big change, so sympathetic tone. Not big changes, but uh, then if we go to uh, parasympathetic tone, same result as in the tilt test. So in tilt test, we saw that the parasympathetic tone went down, and same happens during sleep. So during sleep, instead that the, the parasympathetic, uh, parasympathetic tone should go uh, up, it should go up, it goes down. So there is something wrong in the regulation of sleep uh, and autonomic nervous system in these patients. Something is wrong. And we di did it several times, controlling that it's not an error, it's really, uh, it is there. So in conclusion, and this is from the paper, uh, the results refer to a nocturnal dysfunction of the cardiac autonomic nervous system in chronic fatigue syndrome as a lower parasympathetic tone in deep sleep and higher sympathetic, sympathetic tone as sleep as a whole. I skip this one. These are uh, results from uh, from uh, Valocat, and we saw that. And interestingly, the same patients where this uh, change was uh, large, there was uh, there is still a question mark because I asked Ker Val Valocat to interpret that. Uh, I don't make mistakes. That are these the same patients who also have uh, antibodies? Uh, I'm not yet sure, so I want to uh, give it. But we have tested all these uh, also with antibodies. So I go to conclusions and questions, pretty much the same as, as uh, we heard from the, uh, in Julia. Uh, so the symptoms are variable. They may be uh, easily diagnosed as functional, neurological di symptom disorder, which is the same as conversion. The diagnosis code is F44 po period something, according to which kind of symptoms they have. But just to remind you that uh, uh, functional disorders, including POTS, uh, are now included in the new uh, ICD-11, which should come out next year. And it has a specific code. This is the code 
uh, for POTS uh, in ICD-11. So it, POTS is uh, um, uh, in the neurological disorders among the autonomic nervous system disorders, and it will have a specific diagnosis. And I think that is very good, because if it has a specific diagnosis, then for at least we can compare you know, that uh, in our uh, registries. What about the, the origins of POTS? Uh, we heard about that one, and my feeling is that uh, there is a s genetic susceptibility, uh, some kind of a genetic susceptibility, uh, auto autophilia, so that those who have this autophilia. And then there is a traumatic event w which is uh, causing something, and this traumatic event may be a microbial attack, a viral attack, other immunological attack, it may be a physical trauma, or it may also be a mental trauma, so whatever. <coughs> um, um, and, and just to uh, remember this, and we heard about this, uh, who, uh, who, I think it was a difference between hardware and software and so on. So a function may be disturbed without any structural uh, anatomical uh, damage. So this is like uh, my same thing as Julia, what should be done, and I think everything fits with what Julia was saying. Uh, awareness of POTS, uh, uh, we need, uh, I would say, definitions and of uh, functional disorders as a whole, because there is a lot of misunderstandings. Uh, difference between uh, primary POTS and secondary POTS, again, uh, better diagnosis. And then uh, autonomic tone and perhaps antibodies in POTS versus controls, understanding different mechanisms. Genetic studies uh, uh, looking for also, uh, not only for HLA, but also other, uh, so GVAS and, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, exome studies and so on. What is the role of gut microbiome uh, is also something that uh, could be looked in the cohort studies. Uh, uh, as for antibodies, get Valugat uh, sh showed some results. I had not seen the epitopes, and this uh, today was the first time actually that that uh, we saw some indications of the epitopes. So thank you, Ger, for that because we we have asked that. Okay, you have antibodies, but do you know anything about the epitopes? So uh, it seems that uh, he knows something. Uh, so then, uh, as for treatment, I think that uh, uh, we should really push towards randomized control trials, and that needs to be done in collaboration and with the support uh, of patient organizations and perhaps from the national support, because unfortunately there's uh, pharma pharmacological companies are not very interested, that is my feeling. So really, uh, 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 good uh, uh, RCTs in different uh, methods and so on. Uh, and for example, uh, we have heard from the Mayo three-week program, again, that should be tested in a randomized way, okay, that they go somewhere, but uh, some other people just spend three weeks, you know, playing or something like that, and the other are spending three weeks really in this program. So is it the program or, or is it just uh, spending three weeks in Minnesota? Um, <laughs> Um, uh, what about the immunomodulatory treatments? I would say that before we recommend them, for every, we certainly need to do well-planned uh, uh, randomized control trials. And then I still think we need uh, to know uh, the prevalence and incidence of, of POTS uh, in population, in different age groups, in young children, in teenagers, and, and then uh, in adults, uh, to understand uh, that what is normal and uh, what is um, abnormal. Thank you very much.